So in this lecture, we discuss what do archaeologists draw, and this is the first part, artifacts and landscapes, and we'll be speaking about antiquarianism and codes and conventions along the way as well. Right, so obviously archaeologists illustrate artifacts. Stuart Piggott from the selection in this week's reading states, the draftsman's illustrations are no more passive agents of communication than the author's words they complement and expand. And so right away, Stuart Piggott is signaling these illustrations are not meant to be objective um, uh, representations of the truth. They are also interpretations. I really like Stuart Piggott's words when he discusses this and when he says, we are so used to seeing archaeological conventions and scientific illustrations that we forget that they are based on rules that were codified quite a long time ago. And I, I think he best illustrates this by saying, can you imagine now when expecting to see a, an object in full color, three dimensions, it being replaced by something in 2D as a black and white outline, this shock of seeing something in the archaeological way is is really underplayed and it's just not very um, visible to us these days but I hope through showing you a 3D 2D artifact that might help um, shock some of that recognition into you. So some early work on antiquarian illustration was performed by Stephanie Moser and this is available in the additional readings for this week. Now, Steph went through and she was able to find some of the very earliest illustrations that we've located of artifacts illustrated to what we would consider archaeological conventions. Now, this one is not exactly codified. There's some um, shading versus stippling, things like that. And there's, but you see some early attempts at regularized showing artifacts to a certain scale next to each other, making it so that antiquarians could compare these artifacts to each other. Steph states that these drawings turned objects into evidence through highlighting key attributes of the artifacts. Archaeologists were interested in how rims changed and how handles changed and how they, the shapes of different artifacts might imply some of their use. So these conventions were created to standardize recording, and um, the drawings were very fundamental to the introduction of classification in archaeology, enabling the recognition of object types. And so this, of course, led to being able to form culture groups from artifact types and seriation. So artifacts moved from merely illustrating themes to asking new questions. They were, um, antiquarians would share these illustrations within folios, reproduce them and send them to each other in knowledge exchange. And so they were able to compare their collections to other people's collections. And they was considered an authoritative document in the science of antiquities. They were making evidence through their drawings. They were trying to um, create a larger body of knowledge, extrapolatable knowledge. Steph Moser cites the philosopher Dominic Lopez. Illustrations carry a meaning because they represent an expert interpretation of objects, an interpretation that involves depicting the features of objects in an informative and useful way. So these illustrations were um, expertly drawn uh, versions of interpretations. Now, kind of moving very fast forward in time, this is a photo from the Aid Memoir Project of an illustrator illustrating a potsherd um, to the conventions of which they were formed many hundreds of, years, hundreds of years ago. And so you see some of the tools of the trade there. You see a um, permatrace taped down to graph paper on a drawing board, you see a pottery gauge and a pencil and a pen, and there's not calipers within the drawing, but all of these are very common tools and they're still used in artifact illustration. So why draw artifacts still? Adkins and Adkins go into this a little bit, and that's part of your assigned reading for this week. Um, 
even now as there is um, there are, there's photography available, there's photogrammetry available, there's digital archaeology, archaeological recording of all kinds available, why do we still illustrate artifacts? So we use illustrate them to transform objects into evidence, same as the antiquarians. Um, sometimes a 3D representation does not necessarily tell us as much as a line drawing that illust that highlights very important features. And so, yes, obviously highlighting in interpretive features, but also to translate artifacts to other archaeologists. We've tried to make a... Um, to codify our illustrations in ways that we can instantly recognize the data that other archaeologists are trying to present to us and then put our artifacts into the same kinds of uh, codes and so we can immediately compare them. This is best illustrated often by lithics um, and so I just picked an image from the archaeology data service of some lithics that were drawn um, from the landscape of Frampton on Severn in Gloucestershire. And you see these very simple line drawings. They don't, they don't capture the color or um, some of the other effects that are, come, are considered natural to the stone. They capture the evidence that is interesting to archaeologists in showing the uh, patterns of, of fracture and showing their manufacture and showing the bulbs of percussion. And so this is all evidence that archaeologists wish, wish to present. And here you can see this uh, illustration's actually been digitized as well. So it has been, I don't know actually if it started out digital, but it is um, done with an illustrator pen. This is another illustration. This is pottery from Must Farm by Vicki Herring. And I really wanted to show this in that uh, um, you'll recall the other illustration from the 1600s looking very similar. It is, uh, we're looking at the pottery straight on, a, a very direct azimuth. And we have um, the pots are next to each other on a plane. And so we can easily compare their shapes, their rim sizes, um, and and see immediately what pottery chronologies they belong to. I really like this example because I asked Vicky, uh, who is an excellent, excellent illustrator, to why we still illustrate artifacts, and she immediately said, well, sometimes photography doesn't reveal everything we need to know about an artifact. For example, this fabric from uh, was discovered at Must Farm Bronze Age fabric. It was an amazing discovery, and it was pulled up um, from mud. And so they did the best they could with cleaning it. But um, often the photography only didn't show the fabric very well. It looked very muddy, hard to discern, and so the fabric specialist would look at it and wasn't able to interpret it in the, the way that they needed to and look at the warp and the weft and the size of the, um, the fabric itself. Also, this fabric is very, very um, delicate and so it often needs recording almost immediately because the conservation process can sometimes damage the artifact or make it more difficult to see the fine detail that you need to interpret it. And so this really fantastic drawing, as you see from the scale, one centimeter wide that is able to show the fine work in the Bronze Age fabric manufactured, not necessarily manufactured, but discovered at Must Farm. And there you see a smaller version off to the side. And so this is a re fairly remarkable example that um, hopefully will give you Piggott's shock of the real. You see this is a com combined, um, a combination of a 3D artifact with 2D illustration. So Hugh Gatt, who is a digital heritage graduate um, from our master's program, um, combined the, this, um, these two techniques into a really remarkable looking artifact. And I encourage you to click through and so you can manipulate it and see um, all the different sides of it because he was able to then put the 2D illustration directly onto the 3D artifact to great effect. Right, so moving on to landscapes. 
This is a very early view of Stonehenge, uh, reproduced from Adkins and Adkins, which is also in your reading. And they speculate that this was reproduced by somebody who had never actually seen the monument, but it is very much within a romantic um, tradition of looking at landscapes and um, uh, ancient monuments. As you see kind of in the background, that stone castle didn't really exist. The placing of the stones is incorrect. But it was mostly to portray the feeling of Stonehenge without necessarily measuring it. I quite like this. This is probably one of the earliest illustrations of Stonehenge. Merlin building Stonehenge available in medieval manuscripts. And so um, from early on, these monuments were seen as connected to the fairies, as connected to legends. Um, and so there was not a great deal of work to scientifically illustrate them, obviously, until the antiquarians. I also like to reproduce this uh, illustration. So this is much more in the uh, visual, our visual understanding. Um, this is Haywood Sumner's Hambledon Hill, um, also reproduced from your reading this week. And as you can see, it follows many of the our learned landscape conventions. We see um, many hashirs indicating slope. We see a general outline of the um, of Hambledon Hill, and we have a key in the side. But also, I wanted to highlight how even though it is very scientifically, as we'd consider, done, there's also a lot of deco style to it. It is very, um, it is a very beautiful map, and this was very important to Stuart Pickett that it was able to sh both depict archaeological remains accurately, but also beautifully. Right, so going back in time to Avebury, um, this is one of the earliest depictions that we know of, of Avebury. Um, it is inaccurate, um, and it is done in 1663. As you see, it is from the top down. It is in theory measured, but it reproduces a landscape as to which it might have been. And this is a, um, another survey of Avebury, quite a famous one by John Aubrey, again, 1675, showing us the very beginnings of uh, antiquarian study of landscapes. In this, you see an attempt to show northing of the monument, and then you see the profile that is drawn and the hashir mark starting to form as well. So again, moving through time, Avebury, 1722. Um, this is from the ground plot that was used to show the positions of the stones. And so now we're getting into a mixture of both the stones, but also the more modern buildings that accompany the stones. And we move up to our Orden survey. Now, um, Orden surveys are lovely and they are... Um, a very familiar visual format. So this is from the 1880s, but I don't think you would necessarily be surprised if you opened up an ordnance survey and saw something very similar to this. If you go walking, if you have studied maps, then you will very quickly recognize the visual conventions that are employed to depict this. And we'll be talking about those a little bit more in the map making module. Finally, we go on to a recent publication from the Origins of Avebury, um, 2019, um, wherein you, this is also an archaeological map, but we've lost some things. We've lost the Hashir marks. We have lost um, some of the other fine details that we would think of, for example, in a Haywood Sumner map. But this is very much um, within the current conventions. So I really want you, the one thing I want you to take away from the landscape portion of this is that there are conventions to which we use um, to draw landscapes, but these change over time and they accompany other visual aesthetics. Haywood Sumner was drawing um, according to a deco version of, of um, aesthetics, and this is a much more computerized um, version of aesthetics as well. <clears throat> oh, and I like to include this all-female survey crew, so just to show you some of the tools that they would have used in the past, this is um, 
a plane table and an alidade. And so you you would have to traverse the monuments or the, the place where you were surveying. And that actually is one of the most important parts of doing landscape surveying is, uh, survey is actually moving over the landscape to experience it yourself. And in mapping it, in, in planning, you are more, you look much more closely at the landscape around you. So why draw landscapes? We represent space over time throughout the landscape. We highlight interpretive features on that landscape, again, to translate these landscapes to other archeologists, and finally, to better understand the landscape. And once again, we'll be discussing mapping in more detail in another part of this module.